people for coming. It's great to see familiar faces and colleagues and friends and participants in the program and some people I don't know. Um, tonight I'm going to tell you about the Akamai internship program and how we're tapping into the local workforce to build a science and technology workforce here. Um, hopefully for some of you that are familiar and have heard um, some of the presentations before, I think I'll have some, some different things as well. So um, I hope there's a little something for everybody. And again, I'm from the Institute for Scientists and Engineer Educators at UC Santa Cruz, and we uh, run the Akamai program, and we have uh, since the beginning. So as, as you all know, Mauna Kea and Haleakala are um, amazing sites, and one of the amazing um, aspects of them is the, the, the sighting for telescopes. There's really very few other places in the world um, that can sight telescopes like this. And then, and this has really made telescopes uh, a big core part of the science and technology industry uh, here on Hawaii Island and Maui, but really broadly in the state. Um, telescopes uh, need a local workforce, and there's a lot of young people, students that are um, interested in getting a science or technology uh, job at home. And telescopes really provide an, an exceptional opportunity, both for jobs, but also just for training for other jobs in STEM. So what I hope tonight to tell you and that you come away with um, is sort of related to our experience, to Akamai's experience for many years of doing workforce development, STEM workforce development. Um, and by STEM, I mean science, technology, engineering, and math, and I'll just continue to use that acronym. But the things, the three things that I, I want you to go, go away with tonight is that focusing on the college level is extremely impactful. It's a, it's a really high impact um, uh, point on the educational pipeline to focus on. Um, the demographic uh, disparities that we see in STEM um, are something that can be reduced. And um, the, the ways that we've done this is by applying the social sciences. I hope to tell you a little bit about that. So what we know from, um, psychology and education. Um, the, uh, so the Akamai Workforce Initiative mm -hmm. then is uh, the, what we're overall working to do is to build a, a science and technology uh, workforce in Hawaii. We had our first cohort in 2003 and um, that uh, and that began with early with this federal funding from the Center for, for the Center for Adaptive Optics which funded things for many, many years. And this was ultimately back in 2000 when the center was funded, this was all driven by um, these new, new telescopes that were proposed and being planned at that time. Um, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, which was called ATSB at the time, and the 30 meter telescope. So that was really the drive for the federal funding that, that came that started Akamai. There's a lot of legacies from the center's days that are um, uh, a lot around adaptive optics, um, uh, training for adaptive optics. But one of the main things that, um, that I want to point out is that everything that was developed through the Center for Adaptive Optics became the Institute for Scientists and Engineer Educators and, um, and then Akamai within that. So um, that's sort of the connection back to Santa Cruz. I think a lot of people wonder what, what Santa Cruz had to do with this, but there's this very long, long history that's building on uh, federal funding. So we set out to think about um, telescope workforce development uh, for jobs, for telescope jobs. And if you think, think about the kinds of um, jobs that telescopes have, uh, a lot are in um, engineering and computer science, uh, computer programming, electronics, information technology. And the degrees that lead there um, can be at a whole range of levels, associate, bachelor's, master's, PhD. Um, and so one thing, so this is an example of Keck Observatory. It's about 70% of the personnel there are in the engineering or technical staff. And some uh, specific things to think about um, in terms of workforce development, what's really driving workforce development um, uh, with the telescopes and the related industry. Uh, there's a large fraction of people get hired from the mainland or, or beyond. And there's a really high attrition rate for those that are hired from the mainland, they, um, something like about twice, uh, leave it about twice the rate uh, within three years. So the, and the jobs, when we're thinking about jobs, are primarily technology oriented. And then a really important part is that the current workforce um, really doesn't reflect the diversity of the full population of Hawaii. So groups like Native Hawaiians, women, and other uh, underrepresented groups really aren't participating at the same levels that they are in, in the general population. And this is not specific to Hawaii. We can see this um, throughout the, the U.S. 
Uh, this chart shows on the right hand side, it shows uh, the fraction of the US population um, by demographics. So uh, women and men, white women, you know, various uh, demographic groups. And on the left, it shows their, uh, the fraction of those same groups in the science and engineering workforce. So you can see then for the, on the one extreme, Asian men are 3% of the US population. 14% science and engineering workforce, and the other extreme Hispanic women are 8% of, um, of the population and 2% of, uh, of the science and engineering workforce. And this is, again, this is nationally, so this is uh, fairly, uh, but we see this playing out. We see similar trends here with the telescopes and with the tech industry in Hawaii. So then these groups towards the bottom then are the, what we would call are the underrepresented groups, they're not represented as they are in the general population. Um, what, uh, I started out by saying that, that college level is a really good focus, and one of the main reasons for that is because uh, there's a lot of students that start off interested in science or engineering uh, degrees uh, and going into STEM jobs, and a lot that leave while they're in college, so they never really even get a chance to enter the workforce. This chart shows um, the fraction. So this is a study that looked at students across the United States, so you know, lots and lots of students looking at the, those that were interested in coming in as a freshman and wanted to complete a uh, science or engineering degree, and then how many actually got degrees. And um, this group then divided it um, by uh, two different groups, uh, put white and Asian Americans together, and then African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans. And two things that come up here, one is just the really low rate across the board, which is really concerning that uh, how many students don't succeed in getting a degree that they set out to get. And then the second thing is this, this disparity that is different. That for some groups, it's uh, almost half of what it is for the others. So this is um, a lot of groups and a lot of reports have, have um, advocated for this being a really um, high impact, uh, one of the lowest cost or fastest policy options that, that the U.S. could um, undertake to meet workforce needs. And so increasing by something like just to 50%, which I don't think is enough, I think it should be more, um, uh, could meet something like three quarters of the US workforce needs. So it's a really um, impactful uh, group to focus on. And I, I would also just say from a personal perspective, I think as well, it's, I, I would say, I think it's just the right thing to do to keep people following their dreams and keep them in. So uh, there's that argument too. So this is really where we focus for the Akamai Workforce Initiative is in students that are interested, they enter college and keeping them in through degree and into jobs. And we have been uh, funded and driven by telescopes, but because we want to keep, to have a, uh, in Hawaii to have a, a healthy workforce, you really need to think broadly beyond just the telescopes, even though they're a major driver. And our programs have really emphasized a lot of things that we think are transferable across uh, STEM disciplines and STEM industry. One of the big things is the collaboration with telescopes in the tech industry. That's really been a fruitful um, and, uh, avenue to go. We have telescopes and people in tech that are really, really involved in the program and have been for a long time. And then another um, aspect of what we do, which I think people don't always see, is that we're applying what's known from social sciences about persistence, about keep, keep, keeping people in STEM, and we're applying that to how we design the program and how we implement it. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, before we get started on, the, uh, uh, um, on, on looking at the program, I want to first tell you about the students that have been in the program. They're all Hawaii college students had now more than 400 in the program, and they're all um, from Hawaii or enrolled in a University of Hawaii campus. Um, many of them have graduated from a Hawaii high school, uh, about 23% Native Hawaiian, 38% women, uh, a third of them from community colleges, which is a really important uh, group to serve. And um, more than half are lower division, so really early in their college career. A lot of programs wait until students are juniors or seniors we really uh, want to make sure that we have opportunities for students early on. And so what we designed to the program itself, what it looks like, um, we'll get into some details a little bit later in the talk, but the, the gist of it is there's a preparatory uh, course, one week. Um, there's a mentored project that um, takes place over seven, seven weeks in the summer. And then really there's the um, 
uh, the program goes on essentially for life. We have lots of different activities that continue in the career development and, and have a really strong community. Um, another aspect is the communication coaching and uh, collaborative mentoring, and that happens um, throughout, throughout the first week and the, the whole summer. We focus on communication, which is a skill that's really important no matter what people do. And then we work collaboratively with the mentors at the telescopes and the tech sites. Um, this is where our um, 2019 interns are going this summer. We have 42 interns. It's our biggest cohort ever. It's amazing. Um, and we have uh, students that will be placed on Maui at the telescopes and the tech industry there uh, on Hawaii Island um, as well, the tech industry and the telescopes. And then we have students that are in California and they're with um, the 30 meter telescope either at their project office or at the instrument um, uh, with an instrument team in Santa Cruz. So they do a, um, they complete a seven week project. They get training and coaching on communication. Um, they re we really hope that they and work with them to get them integrated into the workplace. Um, and they make a real contribution. The projects that they do are, are real projects that are of value to the organization. And then they earn credit from here from UH Hilo. So uh, I want to look at the outcomes before we look at the program itself. And so I think it kind of makes for a better order here. Um, so we're looking at, um, again, getting students into jobs. So um, I made an argument that a lot of students leave. So um, a big question is, well, how many of the Akamai students actually stay in STEM? And um, we can look at that. We, we look at it every couple of years. We do a longitudinal study where we track where students are at. And then we can look at, um, and we have to look, of course, a couple of years after they've been in the program. And then we look at whether they stay in STEM or whether they leave STEM after they do the Akamai internship. And so what we include with the staying in STEM is whether they're still enrolled in a uh, degree program or in a STEM job, and then leaving would be changing to a non-STEM major or graduating and then taking a non-STEM job. And we had, um, and so we did this uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2015, and we um, tracked, uh, in that case, the cohort size at that point was 222. Because again, this was uh, three years after the program, so it's a subset of our, num of our numbers. Um, and we um, located 82% of them. And then we could see from there that 70% were in a STEM job and another 17% were either still um, in an undergraduate program or had moved into a graduate program. And so together, though, th those two are what we sort of define as on a STEM pathway, either one of those two things. And that number is 86%. Um, we have a publication on that. So I want to go back now and look at what I just, this chart that I showed you earlier that looked at completion rates uh, nationally. Again, this is the US, uh, US study for looking at completion rates in STEM degrees. And then now add to that to um, compare this to what we've been able to do with Akamai. And so now the, the blue bars are the national study that we were just looking at, and the red bar are Akamai, and we've divided out the same groups that they did in this national study to do this comparison. Um, and you can see here, so this is, there's one thing, which is just that we have a really high fraction that stay in STEM, that persist in STEM. So that number is, uh, is good. And I think probably the more compelling thing is that, um, that we don't see these disparities. So all students are persisting across the, the groups. So I think that's probably the most compelling result that we have. Um, and we've looked at this, these red bars, that, the, the red bars we were just looking at, we've also looked at women versus men, and essentially those are the same, uh, same, same number uh, statistically. Same thing with community college and four-year, uh, seeing the same persistence. So basically what we're seeing is that, that you can really design a program that you can get everybody to be successful in it, um, rather than seeing these sort of disparities in completion rates. We, in between studies, we, uh, we, we can only, it's really actually rather intensive to do these kinds of studies. You have to really track everybody down, so we only do them every couple of years. In between, we're just kind of gathering up information and hearing about jobs, and so we keep track of that and put it on this map. And uh, we know more than 150 in jobs and more than two-thirds are stayed in Hawaii. We know there's a lot more, though, because we haven't done a, a formal uh, tracking in a little while. 
So how did we achieve this success? And this is where the social sciences really comes into play. It's like, how do we actually use what's known about, how do we apply that research to uh, practice essentially? Um, so we're looking at how can we take social science, create an experience in STEM that then leads to this staying in STEM uh, pathway rather than leaving STEM. And so there's a lot of research that can help inform these things. Uh, one thing that, that you immediately um, start thinking about is that there's individuals that are coming in and they each have a unique background and they go into a STEM, to a STEM environment, oops, sorry, and they go into a STEM environment. And so that, those two things are really sort of um, colliding and, there's that, and that creates a STEM experience, an individual in an environment. So for example, Akamai is, is a STEM experience. And so things like um, with individuals, they have different motivations, different aspirations, beliefs about themselves, there's culture and socioeconomics, worldviews, as each person has their own uh, really unique background. And I, I think it's easy to forget, but STEM has its own culture, basically. And so there's things that are happening in the culture, the different ways of communicating and working and giving feedback, and there's bias and beliefs and expectations about people. And so all those things are kind of coming together with these, uh, each unique person having to sort of enter this culture. And some, some being more different than others, where it's more different from the culture they're used to, some more similar. So then when they, so then when you think about a STEM experience now, then with this individuals and these environments, things like how people are interacting, um, expectations and how those are conveyed, um, how people get integrated into the workplace, whether they're sort of an insider, they become insiders or not, um, and even the kind of work that somebody does. All those things are really um, uh, creating this sort of STEM experience. And um, an, an example then from the social sciences is around identity, and um, identity is this um, construct of, uh, of the kind of person that you see yourself as and who you want to be, and we all have identities. Um, and that's it's also something that's always changing about ourselves as well. And, and um, there's a lot of different aspects to your identity. But one of the things that has been really um, interesting from research is that people that really have this strong association of thinking, thinking of themselves as a scientist, as it's part of who they are and who they want to become, are much more likely to persist in STEM than those who don't. And so this is really interesting research that can be applied to um, program development. Um, and, and one of the things, one of the aspects about the, the research on identity is that getting recognition as a science person is a really key part of developing that science identity. So um, getting recognized for the contributions that you do and really feeling like people see you as a scientist. And so we've used that then, and we use that in a range of ways and apply that to the Akamai program to think about program elements that, um, that support students so that they're getting recognized. So then they kind of get that identity and then persist in STEM. And that's really just one example. There's lots of other ways that the social sciences can inform program design. I just wanted to give you an example because it's, there's a lot behind how um, Akamai has been designed. And there's a team of people that make this happen. There's uh, a lot of people and they're pretty uniquely trained as well. They're all scientists and engineers that are using that, the social sciences through other training programs that we've had. Uh, and so that's, there's just a lot more to it. Like I say, there's not just the design of the program, but then you have to have the people that make it happen. And um, they're an amazing team and right here. And um, there's another aspect as well. And that is that each year we have, um, uh, in addition to those core people that run Akamai, we have, we supplement that with people that are coming in from another program um, from our professional development program. And you can see here, we've got, um, got a couple here. We've got Stacy, Ryan, and Devin, one team, and Laisa, Zach, and Ryan, and another team. And so this has been a really exciting part about Akamai, and it's a whole different sort of group of people that we know. Now, I'm instead of um, me telling you about the program components, I want to go through each of these components, but I'm going to have an Akamai alum. Uh, tell you about each of them because we have them right here. The first one is Devin Chu, who's a 2011 um, Akamai alum. Tell us about himself and the prep course. 
Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Just to reintroduce myself, my name is Devin Chu, and as I said here, I'm a 2011 Akamai alum. I also graduated from Hill High School and Dartmouth College, and I'm now currently a graduate student in astronomy and astrophysics at UCLA. So I'll be talking a little bit more about this first step here, the preparatory course. So uh, just for some, a little bit of logistics about how this course works. It's a four day, pretty intensive program where all the interns gather together, a chance to meet one another, but also gain a lot of great skills for preparing for the workforce. Um, and in particular, uh, this particular process is led by the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Akamai staff, and as Lisa mentioned, members of the IC's PDP team, so which is myself, um, and we're the ones that actually will be teaching all the program here. And so they go through different content things such as the workforce preparedness, but also we cover a few science topics. For instance, it varies year to year, but this year we talk a little bit about some different natures of light and adaptive optics. Um, in particular, I'll, pr I'll talk a lot about the inquiry-based activities that the interns actually go through. And this is one of the, uh, I feel some of the highlights of the preparatory course. So what's interesting about the inquiry-based activities is that the interns are essentially placed in these uh, really interesting environments where they have to use their own problem-solving skills to solve a scientific question that they basically pick themselves. These programs are designed where the instructors are not giving this exact problem to solve. The interns find a problem that they want to solve, and they have to use their problem-solving skills to get to a solution. Throughout that process, they're using yeah, experimenting techniques. They also have to use teamwork uh, to be able to figure out what's happening. And then after they go through their investigation, they also then have to present their findings to everyone else, not just the other interns, but to the instructors as well. So this is also fosters this necessary need to think about how to effectively communicate and thoroughly think about how to uh, really explain their solutions and ev using evidence. Uh, and so it's a really neat, uh, really neat experience. I just want to also emphasize that it's very different than the typical cookbook type of labs that most students, including myself at the time as a student, grew up with, where we follow step by step to get to the designed answer using the design steps. It's a very much, much more open and a very challenging way to get to the ultimate result. So I can see personally, it was an incredibly challenging experience because again, it was something very different than I experienced as a student but it was also very rewarding because it very much emulates what we as scientists do in our everyday lives and in our fields where we don't have this cookbook to follow. We have to do our own investigating, come at our own solutions, usually with the team, and then presenting our solutions within our community, maybe outside of our groups. And so it's a really neat experience. I think does a terrific job in preparing, uh, that personally prepared me very much for my internship, but then also further along in my career. I believe that is my slide. I will be passing it over. Yeah, this. thank you. All right, so the next one. Back in time, Austin Barnes, 2009 Akamai alum, and he is the Akamai program manager. So he does works on Akamai all year round. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Austin Barnes, a program manager, as Lisa said. And so I went through the program myself in 2009 uh, when I was an astronomy undergraduate. Uh, and then I've since obviously turned uh, and done the, um, on the other side of the table now. Uh, and so I'll be talking uh, about the second component here, the mentor project, which, which actually, even though it formally takes place, you know, seven weeks over the course of the summer, um, it really begins uh, a lot earlier than that. And it's part of what we, what we call our collaborative mentoring process that we, we work with the mentors. Um, and so we work with the mentors to really create a project experience uh, that is not only productive uh, for the host site but also educational for the intern and sometimes um, a lot of internships will focus on one or the other but we really work with the mentors to make sure that uh, both of those things are, are equally as important uh, this is a picture of the of last year's uh, mentor workshop 2018 mentor workshop which was held here in Hilo um, and uh, this is just one of the components that's funded by uh, TMT and the National Science Foundation. Uh, so the, this collaborative mentoring process really be, begins um, early on in the, in the cycle, so well before the interns are even um, chosen or have submitted their applications. Back starting in January uh, through April is when we get in contact with the mentors at the host organizations and start to source the, the, the projects that we're looking for. And as we do that sourcing, we actually work with the mentors to make sure a lot of our long-term mentors now have it down 
so they know exactly what they want. They have projects that are going to be valuable contributions to their host organizations, um, but also going to be extremely uh, educational for the interns. Um, but, but as we bring on new mentors, we really work with them to make sure that uh, both of those components are part of their project. Um, and, uh, you know, from January when we get in contact all the way through April is when we're going back and forth with mentors and we're going through a really complicated and uh, intensive uh, matching process. So we don't just take the best students um, and the best projects, but we really find uh, the best matches between the two that, that are going to work out uh, throughout the summer. And then uh, after we've, we've uh, formally finalized that process, then in May, uh, again, like about a month before the interns arrive, we have these uh, mentor workshops. And this is something that started in the last, I think, around five, five or six years ago. Uh, and this is when we don't work with every mentor, but it's been a growing community uh, as, we, as we've progressed. And we work with many of the mentors now in this workshop uh, on developing a plan uh, for how they're going to implement their project. And, and, um, and this is, again, another place where we infuse the program with some of the social science research that we, we bring into our, uh, the my program. So we, we work with the mentors to bring in a lot of those uh, components, especially thinking about recognition for the interns for what matters and, and by the, the right people in the host organization um, and, uh, and bolstering the, that identity as a scientist or engineer. And then finally, uh, once we, we get all the interns and the mentors together, um, after the preparatory course that Devin mentioned, we, we get the interns at their site and um, this is when the host organization mentors are obviously really driving uh, what's going on during the summer. So, uh, you know, the, the interns are working full time with the mentors uh, um, for about seven weeks at site. But the Akamai staff really um, continue to mentor the students uh, through what Lisa described as the communication course. Um, and we, we work a lot on different forms from informal to really formal scientific engineering communication skills. And we, we try to support the mentors, and that's also a, a piece of Akamai that we've been trying to increase, especially as we, we brought the mentor workshop online. And uh, I get to introduce, just, a, just to give you a taste of some of these productive projects, what we mean by both educational and uh, valuable to host organizations. Um, here's some uh, examples of some, some uh, Hawaii Island natives. Uh, Brylan Onodera, who is a graduate from Kamehameha Schools, Hawaii, um, she, her first internship, she actually did Akamai twice, uh, was at the WM Keck Observatory uh, with one of our um, now longtime mentors, Truman Wold. And she was working on a, a brainstorming project for improving their counterbalance system for their telescope. And so she did a lot of brainstorming about that and actually uh, created a document that has gone into the Keck archives and, and has been uh, since referenced. Um, and she's finished her mechanical engineering degree at UH Manoa and now uh, is working at uh, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope on Maui and has actually become one of our primary mentors. So she's also gone and now um, is really, you know, it quickly became one of our uh, trusted mentors. Uh, also, um, at Canada France Hawaii Telescope, we had a, a student, Ian Denzer, who was, actually, he was just coming out of his freshman year, so he's still He's still an undergraduate uh, at Yale University studying mechanical engineering, uh, also a Keala Kehe grad, so a, a local boy. And he was um, working on an astrometry camera. They, they built, uh, they designed and fabricated and built and have since installed uh, the mount for an astrometry ca camera on Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So again, he gained an extremely valuable experience going through an entire design process. Uh, but for, for something that they've actually implemented and, and now use on CFHT. And then finally, I just wanted to mention we have two, two others who are back in the program uh, this year. So this is their second time around. Um, and that's something that we, uh, we have every year. We have a few repeat uh, interns that come back. Um, and they're both born and raised here in Hilo. Uh, McKenna attended Kamehameha Schools Hawaii as well. And Olivia was at Waiakea. Um, and both of these, uh, both of these interns last year, they worked. Uh, McKenna worked at Gemini Observatory, and Olivia was one of the interns that actually went up to California to work at uh, the TMT project office. Um, and they both did uh, different projects. One uh, mechanical engineering project, and Olivia was working on a computer science project. Um, and both of which have have actually been implemented and used at the observatories. 
So, um, yeah, I am Stacy Suryoka. I work as an optical systems engineer at the Daniel K. Noy Solar Telescope. Uh, I was indeed an intern in 2007, and one of my instructors, Dave Harrington, sitting back there, uh, back in the day, was also part of the teaching program. Um, but what I, oh, I guess a little bit about where I'm at now. So, after, I think that year I was uh, finishing up undergrad with a physics degree at Pacific University in Oregon. Um, went and taught Japanese in, or in Japan um, jet program for a couple years before going back into graduate school for my PhD in optical sciences. So um, it, it's been a long windy turn, but in the end it resulted in me getting a job back here in Hawaii in, in the hall, which is what I wanted. And um, yeah, I just, just want to talk about the opportunities now that these Akamai interns over the years um, have uh, a great uh, opportunity for themselves um, going forward uh, and it starts with their their Akamai internships so for one they can um, potentially get jobs back at home um, and it's not just the direct pathway as like um, for uh, for me for example um, it was it was an opening a door um, career pathways uh, that became available just because of my experience through Akamai so um, uh, along the road, they, they will have other STEM experiences or non-STEM experiences, but they have this opportunity to come back through Akamai and through the alumni program, uh, which they keep in touch with the students um, throughout the years as they move forward. And one of the, the big things that happen, uh, has happened over a couple, a couple times now are workshops that the alumni, uh, the program puts on for the alumni. Um, last year they hosted one here in Hilo and a few years back there was one on Maui uh, hosted by a National Solar Observatory. Um, I was able to participate in that as a graduate student and that became an uh, opportunity for me to meet the NSO staff and uh, eventually became a, a very good uh, uh, work through a graduate school and then turned into a job for me in this. Um, so these kinds of workshops that come up and bring alumni back together, not only to meet these hosting organizations and the technical um, uh, workforce here in Hawaii, but they also get to meet their peers among the different years uh, of uh, Akamai. So I think last year at the Hanaho event, um, almost every single year, is that right, Lisa? Yeah. We had a representative student. Um, I think just one year you said, right? Just, just the missing. first year we lived. Just yeah. the first yeah. year. So uh, Akamai alums from 2004 through 2017 at that time uh, were present. And this is another branch of the community that exists. It's not just, you know, the people who they interned with and worked with at their summer internship sites, but also the ones that have been alumni who now are part of the technical workforce or are doing other things such as graduate school or, um, uh, maybe doing their own um, work endeavors in the STEM, STEM fields, but to make those connections and to have those opportunities is really um, such a gift that Akamai, I think, provides for students. Um, another thing that, that they've done at both of these workshops, I think, are mock interview sessions. So um, volunteers from, I think, most of the technical organizations come out, professionals in the STEM workforce come um, provide mock interview opportunities for students to get real feedback on their resumes and their interview styles, um, which is very valuable for them to brush up as they are pushing out into the workforce or, or looking at graduate school, for example. Um, and the other, other thing we do is uh, regularly get emails from the Akamai <laughs> program manager uh, talking about the different job opportunities that are coming out here in Hawaii. Um, and it's really great because we know right away that there's something that pops up um, at one of the um, telescope sites or some of the other technical sites. So being, you know, first to hear about that is quite, quite valuable as well. Um, and then the last thing, you know, community, uh, it's, uh, well, I'm still here, Devin's still here, Austin's still here, it kind of shows like it's community, it's a family 
I think we all feel very grateful to be a part of it. And it's um, very, very valuable to all 400 something interns to be, you know, included in this family and have the opportunities that Akamai can provide. Um, for example, uh, so uh, Lisa mentioned now, uh, Brian, and then also two other former Akamai alums also work with me at DKIS, uh, Christelle and Mary. And uh, we're all up there on Haleakala <laughs> quite a number of days um, together. And it's just kind of neat that, you know, this, this community can, can still exist, um, even though we're all, I think Mary and I were the same year. And, I helped instruct Brian one year, and I don't know, it's really nice to have that connection and really does feel more like family um, than anything else, so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to all three for doing that. It's really great to hear from the individuals. Um, so we did, uh, we did win uh, an award, a presidential award for mentoring. Um, Shaw and I in Washington, D.C., getting that award. Jerome is the Associate Director for Research and Development uh, for Akamai. He's not down here today, but he, he is, does so many, many things for the program. Um, this is something, though, that everybody should be proud of. It's something that, that everybody that's part of the program really can be now part of this nationally recognized um, program. I just want to wrap up with the funding sources. We have um, a lot of different funding sources, the 30-meter telescope, the Air Force, Office of Scientific Research, the Hawaii Community Foundation, uh, the, the DKIS Solar Telescope, Keck through an NSF grant, UH Hilo, and the France Hawaii Telescope. And it's always good to just sort of show the amounts uh, that we get. So this just shows our 2019 um, funding sources. And so you can see 30 meter telescope is our major funder of the year. Of course, like College I mean, Hawaii uh, Community Foundation. So it's really now a sort of a community partnership. And I just want to wrap up by saying that, that, that the partnership is uh, really a cr critical thing. Having uh, UC Santa Cruz combining and partnering with UH Hilo to offer this program, and then all of these different organizations that have hosted um, interns over the years. This shows the counts as of 2018. So I hope that what you came away with today, there they are, the 2019 uh, cohort uh, out in front. There's 42 of them. But I do hope that you came away with this, that how, how impactful it can be to focus on the college level, um, that you can reduce those demographic disparities that we see out in the STEM workplace. And um, that a really key that, that we've been using is to apply the social sciences to program design and implementation. Thank you. Any questions? Or Lisa or any of the other presenters? Yes. What is your slide you know, compared to national rates of staying in STEM versus yes. Why is it so low nationally? Yeah, there, I mean, there's, that's a big question, and a lot of people study it. There's lots of different things. I mean, there's studies that have been um, done on it. One of the studies people look at a lot is a bad experience in STEM, so even in, in courses and how it's taught, so students sort of get um, turned off and driven away from it, but there's things like, like identity, there's a lot of cultural things, there's um, differences in motivations, and all sorts of things that are, that are playing into it, but it's a, I mean, it's a huge problem as well that the whole lots of people around the country are trying to address how to change teaching, how to change the STEM experience. Yeah. Is that, um, that what is it at the undergraduate level, the, the attrition rate, or is that, um, how is it measured? Do you know? Yeah, so going back with this, uh, yeah. this one here, this is what you're interested in? Yeah. So it's, it's a, freshman people that, uh, Students entering college as freshmen intending to pursue a STEM degree. And then how many actually complete and end up with a STEM degree when they graduate. And how would that compare to another major, a non-STEM major? Yeah, like social, like a social science social and science humanities. I think they are closer to the like 60% or something. Yeah. 
So the, the problem is, is that it's not, if, if people were just kind of going back and forth, you know, that would be one thing, but the, it's generally, there's you know, some, they come in and they're, they're staying there or maybe a little bit of switch, but people aren't switching into STEM either. So it's just a sort of a loss. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you say, so you have that other plot, you were tracking the alcohol students that, uh, alumni, sorry, that didn't follow our uh, mm -hmm. So um, are you adding also alums that are doing maybe research in STEM education, so the social sciences of mm -hmm. why this is happening um, as a, as a non-STEM major, um, you know, track mm -hmm. or yeah, so we have um, in that publication as well, we list sort of all the, the things that we count, but we're really looking at things where you, where they needed to use their STEM degree is sort of how we, yeah. I don't think we had to have some, an example of that particular, but yeah. I mean, it's a new area that yeah. Yeah, yeah. are thinking about. Roberta, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking that, uh, Probably high school and middle school experience. Well, no, I guess these are the students that have chosen STEM mm -hmm. as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And so they think they have sufficient skill set mm -hmm. to make it through. Could it be that that's where there's the gap? What they need to know and what they think they know, there's just too big a gap. There, well, there's preparation gaps, but there's a lot of research that looks at there's, that there's other things that are going on, that there's students that have the preparation, have the background, and then they ju just don't want to be there. So it could be so. personal even in the whole school. Right. But, but the, the book that's uh, probably the biggest study that was done, it was, it's called Talking About Leaving, and one of the main things that at the top of the list was poor experience with teaching in college, like they had a bad experience with with their science classes, so. Um, I, I just have one thing to, I think the, some, coincidentally, the right-hand side of the room self-segregated to be potential future Akamai interns. <laughs> <laughs> so for their benefit, uh, yeah. can you explain how you, when you announce it, how you find out when to apply, how to apply? Yeah, I'd be happy to. See if they have any questions on the right-hand side of the room. Okay, the right-hand side of the room, okay. okay. Yeah, so let's see. In uh, we announced the program, Austin. Would you say in November, November. October? Yeah, right around Thanksgiving, we announced the program formally, uh, and so we'll, uh, you know, that, that goes out in the email blast. The AkamaiHawaii.org website is where the, the application will be live starting around Thanksgiving, and then uh, up until the deadline, which is a, is typically mid, the middle of February. Um, and then there are visits to the local universities, uh, a lot of, of local universities, not, a, not all of them, but a lot of them um, by representative from the, from the program um, starting in January. Yeah, most, most of the time in January. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so how many applications do you get for each position? I mean, I know 40 is, is one of your largest. 40 is our largest debt. Yeah, 42 is our biggest cohort. I think we had 150, 180 applications. We, let's see, um, yeah, completed applications. We probably ended up with, I think it was actually closer to, to four times. No, it was, yeah, it was around 100, 130, 130, 120, 130 applications for, for the 42 spots, but we also get approximately 60 project, 60 viable projects. So, yeah. yeah. Dave, oh, over there, yes. So, um, out of curiosity, I'm um, wondering about roughly an estimate of how many of the Akamai alumni or people that uh, leave about the Akamai pro program continue to, uh, you know, learn or work on the Milas and Harrison somewhere in the main term out of Florida. Yeah, about uh, two thirds. Yeah, so we have right now what we know. Again, we, we need to do another tracking, but the last time we did it, 150 
in STEM jobs and for more than 100 white. Thank you, you have a question? Uh, I just had a question. I, I know some of the interns are currently going to school on the mainland, mm -hmm. so is it, uh, are there internships, are the applications accepted from all over the mainland then? Well, if they're from Hawaii. If they're yeah. from Hawaii. Yeah, so we usually go through the clubs and sort of word of mouth. But because it is the, the, the funding and the program is aimed at local workers. So. Okay. Yeah. Here's yeah. a follow up on that. So I'm a graduate from Hawaii um, high schools, and I am in uh, Walla Walla, Washington, at okay. university, and no professor knows about Akamai. How are we reaching those? Word of mouth, as we said, <laughs> and for the, yeah, the, a lot of them have white clubs, and that's a good way. Or through word of mouth, we kind of get, you know, some of the university, somebody goes, one guy goes back, tells their friends about it. Can you say that? Want to that? Uh, we, I mean, we, we get in touch with as many boy clubs as we, we have like direct connections with, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's more we could do. Yeah. In the, the press releases that we've been getting as well, when people come home over the holidays and they hear about it, the family tells us about it. So yeah, sort of related to that, one yeah. of the robotics teachers here, yeah. uh, Boston knows this, is, um, wants me to go to Chiao High School yeah. and inform them of that. And you know, I could probably go to Waikia, you know, be in a lot of usual places. And at least they would know before they even go to college. Yeah. If they remember. Yeah. Um, that they would. I mean, because those are obviously all those kids are eligible, right? Right. Anybody goes to Cal. Right, right. right. Yeah, so um, that, and then also, also they have brothers and sisters and, yeah, and you know, sort of, yeah, and there's alumni for all those high schools. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. It's great that you're doing that. So, well, I haven't done it yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, school's out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in the fall. Yeah. Something like that. Right so. before they graduate. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, well, that's the problem, right? You tell them it's like there's. I mean, one problem is, of course, when you're senior, right? You get so much information. That's the world, you know, I don't know. Whatever. Maybe try to do it every year. And, you know, sophomore, junior, senior, so they can kind of you know, see every time. Yeah, Dave. Well, maybe following up on this, um, off the top of my head, there's some fraction of the cohort that's, you know from Hawaii, studying on the mainland wants to come back, and that's some fraction, but um, do you also have a sense of like how many how many people successfully like study on the mainland and land jobs back here and not in my cohort? I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. You know, if we break it down by like where yeah. you studied and where you end up, like, because it feels, it just feels like a lot of people yeah. manage to land jobs here, but I don't know. Yeah, that would be you know. good to do, especially this next time that we track, because we'll have that many more, so we might actually Statistically significant numbers around that. Yeah. Like, do you have an idea of how many the Alchemy cohort is like, I don't know, 20% of them study on mainland or something? Do you even have that number? Yeah, maybe uh, 20 or 30%. It's pretty high. Okay. Oh, one more. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So if there is. If there was one thing that you can say that this is what is making Akamai so different or is attacking the STEM, um, you know, uh, loss of, of, of females or minority students, is there something, maybe it's not the most important, but something that you think kind of stands out is the way in which you um, foster or nurture or do the whole research experience that, that, that makes these students stick with STEM? Is there something like that? take home inspirational yeah. thought. Yeah, a hard question, but I mean, I think I, I brought up the whole thing around identity because I think that that is a really key part of it and that it's having a, a project that you do that really makes, that's a real project, real contribution and you feel like you um, contributed and get recognized for you know, doing a project and for being a scientist and, you know, a lot of the things we do are kind of aiming at that. So I feel like that's probably, I would take one thing, take away. Yeah, I, would, yeah. I mean, the mentor workshop we aim at, we talk about recognition, 
communication course, we talk, we have the abstract writing, final presentation, um, even elevator talks, communicating the project on the resume. So we're, a lot is directed, a lot of attention is directed at making sure that the interns work gets recognized and they realize that, that they're getting recognized for that work by the people who matter. I think that that's probably, yeah, that's a good contributor. To add to that too though, that they have to have a good project to do that. Have to have something to get recognized for. Yeah. Over the 16 years of the program, was there anything that cropped up that you had to change? We were sort of like tinkers all the time. <laughs> Engineers were changing all of the time. Let's see, things that didn't work though. Oh boy. We've had it be stable for a while. Projects that blew up because it didn't go where they wanted to go. We say one thing that doesn't work is to for some organization to say yes, we have a project. We'll figure out later on who mentors it. Sure. That often does not work out. Work out because um, it doesn't come to be, or a student shows up surprised and a mentor is surprised and they didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. we've had we've had some experience. Jerome, did you I was thinking yeah. maybe the separate prep courses. So there's the overall Akamai cohort, but the placements and internships are just on two islands, Maui and the Big Island. And many years ago, there <laughs> was a separate prep course on Maui and a separate prep course on the Big Island. Yeah. And, um, Still, for the same summer and the staggering and the staffing, too messy. And it's also nice that given that there are those two island separate geographic locations, that at least at the start, everyone is all together, gets to know each other and build that community. So once they go to the respective island, like, they've got something to hold on to. I'm part of the larger, the larger Akamai family. Yeah, so I was wondering um, if maybe the Native American community on the mainland had something like this. For I mean, they must have the same problem, you know, keeping their kids in STEM. I was wondering if they reached out to you or if you communicate with them at all. I'm just trying to think of some community that's sort of like what we have here. Yeah, I mean, there's communities all over the U.S. that are like that, and there's a lot of different programs. It was actually really neat going for that award. Um, we met so many people that did these really long, like 25 or 30 year old programs. That was too one really inspirational. What, what community are they directed to, the ones that have been going that long? Are they specifically like a geographic area? Or a... They were from all over, all over the US. Yeah. And then some that were more focused on women. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of Another yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that same topic. Uh, I'm working with a group here in New York and help Wales mm -hmm. perpetuate a unique education opportunity. Um, we're formed to help uh, be advocates for kids that are Native Hawaiian kids or Native kids who want to go into STEM, but maybe because of peer pressure or the anti the telescope. The Way I was kind of formed to be an advocate for it's okay to be um, into science and it's okay to be culturally sensitive. There should be no separation. So um, that's what we're doing, and uh, we'd be happy to work closer with uh, my and students to let them know that you know it's okay to be in STEM and your culture does really accept science in the future, instead of as you see some of the uh, attacks, even from the university community, saying <clears throat> no to certain careers, science being done in what I can. Rayo is uh, was formed to uh, be an advocate to say, no, that's okay. Yes, 
scientist to be a navigator to be able to explore the problems that happen in the CTA. So we're trying to address that people leaving uh, STEM or perhaps peer pressure. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have one more. Is there any specific time of the year when this working with the mentor has to happen for the recent It has to happen over the summer so that students don't have to take it a break from their studies. And then we need to have them all at the same time as well. So we just do it in the summer. And it's even constrained because we want to serve different uh, academic years. Yeah. To really, you know, tell the kids earlier, they start later, and so we try to find that spot right in the middle where we can serve as many students as possible, or have the opportunity. Yeah. And how early can a student, how early can a student start this program? They have to have completed at least their freshman year in college, so they would apply when they're a freshman. And then they can apply um, just after graduation as well, so we can have up to a year after. These are great questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Really uh, wonderful to talk with you all and share the outcomes.